and good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. This is Harrison Smith back with another episode of Cinema. And um, I wanted to do something a little different for this episode. It's not so much about a topic as it is about an idea. And I floated it on Twitter and got some great feedback. And I I think I know the direction I'm going in, and it it can involve all of you that are listening. So I figured, again, I've been scaling back my episodes to make sure that I have something to say instead of just posting an empty episode once a week that really has nothing to say. So this week, uh, this episode is going to focus on a project. I was approached uh, to do a horror documentary on the history of horror. And I think because I've, I've talked so much about uh, some films that are, I, I wouldn't say they're obscure, but they don't always get the press that a lot of these other horror films do, especially in the way of Friday the 13th and Halloween and Hellraiser and Texas Chainsaw Massacre and, and you know the rest. So uh, it's, it's always not kind of the same thing, but it's just uh, there is a disproportionate amount of attention that, that gets to some of these films. And my question uh, to, to the Twitterverse was, has Eli Roth really done the definitive horror documentary for AMC, uh, Eli Roth's The History of Horror? And I've, I've seen the series uh, to date, and uh, I think it's extremely well done. And most of all, uh, the, the kind of characters, I mean, uh, characters, actors, and talent that he has brought to this documentary I mean, how do you really kind of top that? I mean, when you're going from Quentin Tarantino and you know, Robert Englund and Slash and, and everybody else, uh, I mean, where do you go with that? What, what do I have to offer and bring to the table? I don't have an AMC budget and the budget that's being offered to me is certainly not anywhere close to afford to pay this kind of talent to, to sit down with me. And most of all, I guess, would it just be saying the same thing over and over again? Uh, There's only so many behind the scenes stories that you can get about the making of A Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th or Halloween. And I'm I'm sure that John Carpenter is very tired of of telling the same old story. How did you get the idea for Halloween? And this is what we did. And and then when we shot, we did this. And, you know, and we we shot in uh, Pasadena. And here's the the story of the neighbors chasing us away while we were shooting. I mean, it's been now 40 years so it's a long time uh, to tell these same stories over and over. And thanks to the internet, you can get a lot of this information readily at your fingertips without having to sit through an episode of a documentary or, or anything like that. A while back, I wrote a, a series for Dread Central on, on my personal swimming with horror, swimming upstream. Because for those of us who are involved in the genre and making this kind of content, we get a lot of pushback. Uh, we're, we're the cause for the downfall of Western society. Uh, we're, we're the reason for the corruption of youth and, and all that nonsense that, that comes out of it. And um, so I'm, I'm not going to belabor that in this. What does this have to do with you? Well, I thought about doing this documentary and the only way that I would really do one is if I could do it from the personal aspect because I've often said in my previous podcasts, Horror is personal. The best horror is personal. What scares us the most is what affects us personally. And and I've talked about this many, many times in the way that there are some people that sit and watch The Exorcist and like Beetlejuice, it just keeps getting funnier every time I watch it. Uh, Yeah, for some people, that is not horror. Okay, that's just a good time. They have a good time. They laugh at it, whether, and they don't have to be atheists. They don't even have to be agnostic. It's just, It wasn't their thing. That kind of horror, supernatural horror, possession, demonic, it doesn't scare them. And yet you will find other people that you hear what does scare them and you're like, that? And for me, my personal one, and I've said this many times before, is the the concept of clowns that are just so terrifying. I, I don't think the clown itself, the image of the clown, the clown even used in horror is all that terrifying. I really don't. And I think a lot of people jumped on that bandwagon. I don't know if it started that or if it's just been a thing that as social media grew and media attention grew, people could gather uh, attention to themselves 
by saying, oh my God, clowns scare me. I'm so terrified of clowns. I, I, I just don't buy it. And that's fine. Some of you may have a, a legitimate horror and, and fear of clowns. So be it. But I don't think the, the problem is as widespread as we're meant to believe. But again, what scares some people doesn't scare others. Jaws, some people find terrifying and others, nothing at all. They shrug it off and it's, it's a big fake mechanical shark and it's one of the dumbest movies they've seen. I've heard people say it. Why make a documentary? And again, if I could do it from a personal standpoint of growing up as a little boy and discussing some of the scariest films that bothered me and why and talking about their historical context. And I just had a conversation about this yesterday with, with one of my producers and my director of photography. And we were discussing uh, horror itself and why, for example, that you know the remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street and the remake of Friday the 13th really failed to launch. They, I mean, I, I guess, you know, the Nightmare on Elm Street one gets a lot more hatred because, you know, Robert Englund is the definitive Freddy Krueger. And a lot of it was just simply that it's not Robert Englund. And so be it. However, the other thing is the historical context around both movies. And, and I said the number one thing that became scarier than Freddy or Jason, or even Michael in Halloween, was the end of the 80s and the advent of AIDS. Okay, the disease, AIDS. That was really, and literally, have sex and possibly die. So life was imitating art in this case. And those movies have now been remade into a generation that has grown up with AIDS, AIDS in the background, always running as an operating system in the background and other diseases. And then in the also uh, with terrorism and school shootings, uh, all of these things have become far more terrifying to teenagers and young people than a masked guy running through the woods with a machete or a burned guy scaring you in your dreams. And therefore, the historical context around these motion pictures has changed. And you can hear more about this uh, in my one uh, podcast episode, Friday the 13th Got Lucky. Growing up, Invasion of the Body Snatchers was the scariest film I had ever seen, and, and for one reason. In my opinion, without sounding terribly paranoid, it came true. The last two decades have seen a rise in declarations of 1984 and, and even Brave New World. And the irony is people want to shotgun those two novels into almost every social crisis situation. And the sad truth is, very few have read either book. It's part of the fall in line mentality. Some call them sheep or the popular term is sheeple, but I prefer to call them fish. And here is why. Invasion of Body Snatchers. Well, it's about conformity. If you remember, an alien race of creatures taking the form of seed pods replicate their hosts when they sleep and they kill the original and, uh, you know, you and I and form a perfect carbon, literally, copy. The original person turns to dust. The copy transfers all of its memories and physical traits, but is soulless, no emotions. It's an automaton, like turning Scarlett Johansson into a sex doll. The horror film field faces a similar situation at the moment. It has its own existential crisis. I mean, certain brands are emerging, designer labels almost, if you will, and, and while on the surface it looks like horror, sounds like horror, it's kind of an imitation. There's nothing personal to it. And I shouldn't say this is across the board, but my point is, if I am going to do a documentary of any kind on the genre, then it really should be personal. And it might introduce people out there watching it to these kind of films ago, I might try that. I've never really tried horror before, but the way this guy is presenting this, I might want to see that and make a decision for myself. Now, making a video, like a documentary film, it just didn't sit with me. I mean, just alone, you know, to get the rights to the visuals and use the rights of the clips and blah, 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 blah. And then I keep thinking, nobody wants to just sit and listen to me. And if you're watching TV, it's like, how about let's get some actors on here. Let's get some celebrities who have been in the genre. And then it starts to turn into a far bigger thing. 
So I thought what I would do is write a book. And I think that's the direction I'm going to go. And I think because Jaws the Revenge instigated this podcast and the concept of cinema, I think I just might call the book, This Time It's Personal. And then some kind of subtitle, A Look at Horror Through a Genre Filmmaker's Journey, something like that. I don't know. I'm just going off the top of my head. But the cool part would be, in making it personal, is hearing from all of you. Like, I would be able to tweet and say, I'm, I'm doing a chapter on this film. And I'd like to hear what you thought about it. And hear a personal story about it. In which you could email me. Or you could post a, a public Twitter thread on what the film was like for you when you saw it. What did it do for you? And if it didn't do anything for you, you don't have to respond. But there's a chance for you to get into a book. Because I'm looking for the way that horror has affected all of us personally. And again, what scares you may not scare me, and vice versa. It's all subjective. So, I mean, I once worked with a guy who was about as conformist as you could get. And on the political spectrum, he was somewhere between like Richard Nixon and Rush Limbaugh, leaning more to the right of Rush Limbaugh. And for some reason, he pegged me as some kind of like liberal leftover hippie and I was his professional nemesis. And after a meeting at work one time, he stopped me in the hallway and he declared in front of a number of my coworkers, you know what your problem is, Smith? And don't you love when someone knows exactly what your fucking problem is and has no issue telling you? He said, you're like a salmon. All the other fish go with the flow. They go downstream and you, I mean, you, Smith, you just go against the current every time and you're getting all beaten up and finally getting to where you want to go and then you'll die. Why you, he, Why can't you be like us other fish and just go with the flow downstream? Now what the hell do you say to that? I mean, I'm sure some of you have answers right now. I mean, I thought about it standing there in the hallway and in some bizarre way, felt that he had branded me right there. He might have inadvertently summed up my entire life with that analysis. And I thought about it, and then I replied, You know what else floats downstream, Mike? Shit. Look, I, I've been swimming upstream all my life. Maybe to the horror watershed. And what happens once you get there? I like to think I still have a journey ahead of me. The, the originals in Invasion of the Body Snatchers posed a threat to the duplicates. They reacted by pointing and letting out a horrid shriek that served as an alarm to the others. They would chase you down, and they wouldn't kill you. They'd make you go to sleep, and then when you wake up, you're born into a whole new world. And some argue that's what's happening now with horror. And a lot of things. Look, we, we can just look around us right now. And again, if you don't agree with someone, whether it's over masks, whether it's over politics, whether it's over religion, they scream and they try to out you and they try to cancel you and they try to publicly humiliate you, embarrass you. And it's very much like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. So keeping this personal and why horror is personal to me that's why Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the 1978-79 uh, Donald Sutherland film, is the scariest damn movie I have ever seen. Because we are living it right now. And look, my first film was the feature film The Fields with Cloris Leachman and Tara Reid. And I didn't direct it. I wrote and produced it. And I've talked about it many times on this podcast. And it was based on the true story of what happened to me on my grandparents' little farmette in the late summer, early fall of 1973. And the film did well, although I was disappointed by the final product and, and felt that the directors decided to really try to turn it into a horror movie when it was actually a thriller during the production. And, and I wasn't really happy about that, but oh well. Many have liked the film. And it did well, and it's been widely acclaimed. It's on NBC's Peacock, and it's on Tubi, and it's all over the place. It does suffice to say for me, however, it's not the movie that I would have made. Where the field shines is on the personal relationship between the boy and his grandmother, my nanny. My grandfather was Pappy. 
Nanny was a foul-mouthed, chain-smoking woman with a heart of gold. And Cloris Leachman's performance in that film is less a portrayal than it is a channeling of my grandmother. When you watch The Fields, that is the closest I will ever get to seeing my grandmother alive again. But keeping this personal and what I would be talking about in my book is that it was important to show Gladys, my grandmother, my nanny, watching late night horror films with me. That's what nanny did. We would sit up late on Friday nights and Saturday nights and watch the CBS late night movie or one of the subsidiary stations out of New York like WPIX, Channel 11, WOR, Channel 9, and so forth. And they aired everything from the classic Universal Monsters and all of their extended universe sequels and mashups to Peter Cushing, Christopher Lee, and the entire Planet of the Apes films that were available at the time. And horror for me served as an escape because on Saturday afternoons, right after the cartoon lineups of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You, Land of the Lost, Fat Albert, and even the Brady Kids, you had the hijinks of Dr. Shock out of Philly and a variety of creature double feature type shows, and they brought you more of the same, but also Godzilla, and I caught many of my big bug horrors like Them, The Giant Tarantula, The Beginning of the End, and the bizarre non-bug, non-carbon, remember this one based horror? The Monolith Monsters. Remember that one? They were just like big rocks that grew out of the ground, and I think turned everybody into to stone that came in touch with them. And I saw Night of the Living Dead on TV with my grandmother one night. And after it scared me so badly, she let me know that many of the actors had been paid in Kentucky Fried Chicken. And we laughed like hell at the killer shrews and both creeped out, both of us did, over a horror film that's really a social horror called Bad Ronald. I was privileged to run into an author named Bruce Markison at a Scaricon a couple years ago. And he interviewed me about my interest in my history, my knowledge of the history of horror. And he was working on a book that eventually would be called Hosted Horror on Television. He was looking at uh, the films and the horror hosts that hosted them on these Saturday afternoon creature feature, late night uh, creature feature type shows. And he gave me a wonderful dedication and uh, you know a shout out. My, my interviews are all throughout his book. And it's again called Horror, I'm sorry, Hosted Horror on Television. And it, the subtitle is The Films and Faces of Shock Theater, Creature Features, and Chiller Theater. And it's a wonderful book. I've read it, and not just because I'm in it, but because it's really good and it's extremely extensive. But most of all, it is personal. And that inspired me. It was actually Bruce Markison's book that actually inspired me to say, instead of a horror video film documentary, I think I'm just going to do a book. I think that would be the best way to do it. And it could be personal and detailed. I mean, why was horror an escape for me? I, I came from a pretty turbulent home life as a boy. This is why I spent so much time with my nanny and pappy. They were safe harbor in a long running series of violent domestic storms. And by the age of seven, I could name and recognize Price and Karloff and Lori and Lugosi and Cushing and Lee and more. I knew my monsters and Nanny would sit close by in her overstuffed recliner, cigarette in hand over a standing floor ashtray and tell me the behind the scenes magic and how they did that to make me less scared, but to also show how much she knew. My grandmother was the living internet. She knew shit that I have no idea how she knew it because she never left the house and there was no computer. I mean, she had a phone, but there was no internet to bring so much to her. But son of a bitch, if she didn't know how Karloff was put into makeup and that he was originally green, but they did that to shoot the film in black and white, on and on. She was a fountain of horror information and horror became something more to me. It wasn't just scary movies. I became involved in it. It became personal. Nanny and I watched the Universal Frankenstein films and saw them as horror soap operas. First the monster was a muck, then he died, but he didn't die, and then he finds a mate. From there it went on to all the wonderful sequels and pre-Freddy vs. Jason matchups and House of movies with Count Dracula. And of course, there was Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, which I talked about in a recent interview that was really... 
my introduction to horror. And during this time, I was also forming my own personal idea of horror. I felt awful for Larry Talbot and his curse. It killed me to know that when he awoke in his crypt, he could not remember anything. And I followed his trek to find Dr. Frankenstein and I was in an entire world long before the Marvel comics and, and you know DC franchises. It's a shame how Universal screwed it all up in trying to make their own dark universe. Instead of relying on the power of their original classic monsters, they tried to ape the entire Marvel machine and after Dracula untold in The Mummy, well, we see how well that turned out. I mean, watching horror was a personal experience. You didn't have a menu of, of 700 streaming choices. You got what was presented. So when Let's Scare Jessica to Death was on at 10 p.m. Saturday night, you watched it or you didn't see it again until some programmer felt it was time to rotate it back through. You watch those films with commercial interruptions, which often gave a little kid like me a breather from the terror, and often in the dark, the room lit by the tube TV light. Nanny popped up Jiffy Pop on the stove, and she served 7-Up from those old green glass bottles and bought me Libby Land TV dinners with a special dessert to settle in and watch that monster mayhem. And that simply does not happen anymore, and that's why Bruce Marcuson wrote such a fantastic book. And that's why Fright Night, 1985's Tom Holland's Fright Night, appeals to me so much because Fright Night, they call it like a Valentine to horror. It's really a eulogy. Fright Night is saying goodbye to an entire era of not just filmmaking, but horror host filmmaking. And actually I find Fright Night kind of maudlin and sad. Not scary, but very sentimental. I can say without hesitation that if Halloween were made today instead of 1977, 78, it would be straight to streaming. It would be a home video release and it would never touch a silver screen. COVID aside, horror is denied screens today unless it is name brand, big name horror or right from Blumhouse and has the backing of the major distributors. The day and age of small, low, really low budget horror films, like a movie like Squirm, remember that with the killer worms? That's not getting a theatrical release today. But back then, somebody took a chance on it. The pandemic has its own impact on theater screenings, but let's face it. Theatrical releases were in big trouble long before COVID. As content becomes more and more homogenized and audiences simply fall asleep. You see what I did there? I brought it full circle all the way back. To invasion of the body snatchers. Yeah, there were horror soap operas growing up and there was dark shadows, and but it never caught my attention like Universal's tragic classic monsters and their own brand of soap opera. For me, it was the classic Universal monsters. The creature from the Black Lagoon's creature suit still stands up and Millicent Patrick continues to go on as one of horror's unsung heroines. The creature was also a tragic monster and weirdly, his third outing in 3D would come to mind as I sat in a theater in 1983 suffering through Jaws 3D. Rainy afternoons watching classic black and white horror or, or late night Fridays and Saturdays at the great age of six, seven, and eight, watching the same stuff shaped me as a future filmmaker. I knew what I liked. And most of all, I got a great variety of horror that allowed the formation of a solid base. There's a scene in the fields with Cloris sitting in her chair, smoking. Right next to, next to her is that high floor ashtray beside her. Newspaper over her lap and that blue TV light. That is exactly how I remember my grandmother. I can see her now as I speak about it. She gave me my horror foundation. She shaped my first very small steps into the genre and as a professional filmmaker. And she wasn't even aware of it. The Harrison Smith brand was forming even at that young age, but there was a long way to go. I had not yet discovered horror publications, books, magazines, and Stephen King was still years away from publishing Carrie. However, horror on the big screen thrived as the economy stayed in the toilet and Watergate took the headlines and drive-ins were still big and, and a little horror film like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre could find an audience on the big screen and not just vanish into the ether. I was about to discover that the big screen was the waterway for some salmon filmmakers to fight their way through upstream. 
George Romero comes to mind as a salmon who took his beatings to get to the end. Carpenter as well. I think I'm going to write this book. And I'd like you to be a part of it. So pay attention to my Twitter timeline. Ask your friends to follow me if, if they're into horror and would like to get their personal uh, adventures or experiences into this book. That's what I'm excited about because horror is personal and horror is also to be shared. Thank you for listening. I look forward to talking to you again real soon. And stay tuned for news on this book and how you can be a part of it. Thank you.